Welcome everyone to the Santa Cruz Pickwick Club. And uh, we have a guest speaker today. I'll say more about uh, Lee Jackson uh, once everyone is in the room. But I just want to, to welcome everyone. Uh, familiar faces, familiar names, some new people, people I, I don't recognize. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I know that this talk, this presentation by Lee has been widely advertised. So we may have some first time attendees for the uh, Santa Cruz Pickwick Club. So welcome to all of you. I, I'm gonna, I'm John Jordan. I'm the uh, convener for today and also the co-director of the, of the Dickens Project, which is located at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And uh, I'll have a, a few general announcements about the Pickwick Club and our plans going forward before I do an introduction for Lee. But um, hello, and uh, are there are there first timers here? People who are who are here for... first timer. Yes, good. Welcome. <laughs> and where are you? I'm in SoCal. In Soquel, California, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I inherited some books, um, the Dickens story, 15 volumes of, um, from the Clarkson Company. Aaron, from the get 1800s, out of the way. From the 1800s. So I'm starting to look at them and I thought I should jump on this, this, uh, this class. Okay, welcome, glad to have you here. Uh, are there other first timers people? Yes, and... Uh, Carrie, yes, where are you, Carrie? Uh, Durham, North Carolina. Durham, North Carolina. Good, good. Turn that on. Other first timers, if if you are, yes, Kathleen. I'm oh, sorry, I'm I'm in Holderness, which is the bit of Yorkshire that sticks out into the North Sea in England. Very good, very good. Glad I'm, to have you with us. Glad to be here. <laughs> my name is Harry Royal. This is my first time. I also live in England, in Colchester, in Essex, a bit further south from okay. uh, the previous lady. Thank you. Thank you. Any Anyone else want to? Yes. <laughs> my name is uh, Bill Radke, and I'm in Los Gatos, so not far from you. Los, Los Gatos, California. And I see, I see other longtime friends uh, as well. So glad to have you back. Um, I'm gonna wait another minute or so and then make some announcements and uh, introduce our speaker for today. So why, why don't I go ahead and, and, and make some general announcements. I mean, this is the last meeting of the Pickwick Club for this academic year. We, uh, we university types think in terms of academic years rather than calendar years. So we do not meet in July and we do not meet in August. We will resume in September our monthly meetings. And we don't meet in July because that is the month of the annual Dickens Universe at uh, UC Santa Cruz, which will take place this year from July 23rd to July 29th. This is, golly, our 43rd, I think, annual Dickens Universe. We've been going for quite a while. And the focus for this year's Dickens Universe is A Tale of Two Cities. Um, every year we focus on a single Dickens novel or sometimes a pair of, of novels, one by Dickens and one by another 19th century writer. And uh, this year we're going back to our traditional format, which is a, a single novel. It's been, it's been quite a while since we did uh, A Tale of Two Cities as the principal novel. So it's a novel that I'm, I'm rereading and it's a, it's, it's a novel which is fresh and new and exciting. And I think it's a magnificent 
novel. It's it's better than I remembered thinking it was. So <laughs> I'm I'm thrilled to, uh, and we have a fine lineup of speakers for the Dickens Universe. Um, uh, I'll I'll mention just a, a a couple of them. We have uh, Kathy Gallagher from uh, UC Berkeley, a distinguished Victorianist. Andrew Miller from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and our very own Renee Fox, who is here present with me. So when we, uh, when we begin, uh, after I introduce Lee, uh, Lee will have the floor for 35 or 40 minutes to give a presentation. And then we will open the floor for questions and we'll have a question and answer period. We have two hours of schedule time and uh, we won't go beyond that, but if we end early, that, that would be okay. Um, in terms of procedures, we will use the raised hand function at the bottom of your screen. Most of you, I hope, are familiar with that. Uh, and I will call on people in the order in which they appear on my screen. You can also, if you have a question or a comment, put it into the chat and my colleague Renee will monitor the chat and interrupt me if uh, she wants to uh, announce something that has appeared in the chat that's relevant for everyone. Um, when we uh, resume the regular schedule of the Pickwick Club in um, September, uh, it will, we will continue our usual focus, which is to choose a single Dickens novel and uh, read it and discuss it over a period of three months. And we will canvass the regular membership of the, of the Pickwick Club to get uh, preferences from among our, our audience, our members, as to that. And if there is anyone who is uh, interested in being a leader, a discussion leader, and has a particular book in mind that you would like to lead a discussion on, please get in touch with, with me or with uh, Courtney Mahaney, who is the, assist the usual assistant for the, uh, for the Pickwick Club and who sends out the announcements and the messages. So that's the general announcements that I have. I'm going to introduce our principal speaker for today, who is Lee Jackson, I want to welcome him and thank him very much for agreeing to talk with us. Lee has long been fascinated by the social history of Victorian London. He's perhaps best known for his online encyclopedia of primary sources, the Dictionary of Victorian London, which is a website now 20 years old, and also for his study of Victorian filth a book entitled Dirty Old London that was published by Yale University Press in 2014. He recently completed a PhD on Dickensian tourism at Royal Holloway, the University of London, and serves as an academic advisor to the Dickens Museum on matters topographical. His new book, drawing on his PhD dissertation, entitled Dickens Land, The Curious History of Dickens's London, will be published by Yale University Press in September. So we are getting a preview of the book that will be out in the fall. So thank you very much, Lee. Uh, the floor is yours. Please take it away. Thank you very, very much um, for having me. I have the traumatic task now of sharing my screen. Bear with me. I think it should work reasonably okay uh full screen mode okay i'm hoping you can see my slides now um can i have a yes from somebody yes yes brilliant okay fabulous um yes thank you uh for having me it's great to be here i'm just going to go sort of straight into it um my book is about dickens london as a tourist attraction so it's not a guidebook to dickens london although i have written one if you want to root that out as well but it it's actually a book about people, about how people have visited and gone to the places described in Dickens's fiction, um, really for, well, for 150 years, certainly. So it's, it's a very long lived uh, practice. The book particularly covers the years around about 1880 to roughly, say, 1930, 
um, when Dickens tourism uh, was at its peak. Um, it was much more popular then than now, although of course it still continues. And I think the story of sort of Dickens land, this sort of literary territory, as we might call it, tells us something not only specifically about sort of how and why Dickens was celebrated after his death, but also, um, say, the Victorians, really sort of pervasive fascination with history and heritage and historic place. And he also tells us the study of Dickens land, how heritage sites are not sort of merely discovered and catalogued for people, but actually very much shaped and manufactured, uh, manufactured to suit visitors and almost shaped by those visitors in a way. And this is, you know, this is not a new insight. This is a sort of well-known insight of tourism studies generally. Um, but I think Dickens provides us with, um, and Dickens Land provides us with a fascinating example of that. Um, top marks, if you can identify all, all the images I put on this first screen, apart from my book cover, obviously. Um, we have the old curiosity shop there in, in Holborn, which is still there. We have, I think, bottom left, I'm 99% sure is Johnson Street, a demolished early home of Dickens. So occluded in the sort of bottom middle is the entrance to the Dickens Museum uh, with people being Dickensian characters. Bottom right, you have the George Inn in uh, the borough, which is still there. And top right, really hidden top right, those are Nancy's steps on um, London Bridge. So I'm going to talk about various of those places. Um, now, the first recorded Dickens tourist uh, was Louisa May Alcott. Mm -hmm. That's what I've been able to find. I've spent a lot of time looking, so I'm fairly sure uh, we are talking about Louisa May Alcott. Um, she visited London as part of a tour of Europe in 1866. She was uh, initially actually someone's sort of helpmate come nursemaid, but she, she got out of that in the end and came to London. She came once, then came back on her own. Um, and she was a massive fan of Dickens. Uh, she could recite famously sections of the books by heart. She adapted them to amateur theatricals for her friends and family. Uh, she even had a fondness for Dickensian catchphrases. Uh, one acquaintance recalled, I quote, that her ascent always took the form of Barkis is willing. Uh, that famous <laughs> quote, of course, from David Copperfield. So she was, she was chaperoned, um, she was in London in, in the sort of second visit to London. She was chaperoned around sites in London uh, by a fellow American, in fact, uh, a gentleman called Moses Coit Tyler, who would later become the first US professor of American history based at Cornell. Um, but in, in the mid 1860s, he was in London and via mutual acquaintance, I think he became a chaperone. And she would write up this experience of going around Dickens London um, in a barely fictionalized short story, in, which was published in 1867 uh, called A Dickens Day. And, you know, you can see from this quote I put on, put on the screen, she went to lots of the sort of standard tourist sites, Tower, Tower of London, Windsor, various parks and so on. She looked at Samuel Johnson's house, um, Milton, a house called Milton's house. We'll come to that. I can come to that later on, maybe. But she also looked at Dickensian sites. And in particular, um, she went to the Saracen's Head, which, of course, is a coaching inn which features in Nicholas Nickleby. Um, and she went to Sari Gamps, which was... Uh, a house on Kingsgate Street in central London, mentioned in Martin Chuzzlewit, that you can see it in Martin Chuzzlewit. And she went to see where Dickens had lived with his young man, uh, Furnival's Inn. So she was the first do well documented sort of Dickens tourist and Dickens literary topographer, because she wrote all this stuff up as well. And th that's significant because Americans have always been the greatest enthusiasts for Dickens London. Um, there would be a trio of American articles marking, marking Dickens' death in 1870, all of which had some topographical content. Uh, one was by a gentleman called Montcure Conway, who was living in London. He was an acquaintance of Alcott's, I think actually her, her literary agent in London as well. And, it, you know, the first three or four items you see talking about Dickens' London are all by Americans. Now, it didn't catch on immediately, this idea of touring, uh, touring Dickens' London. There was a travelogue produced in 1876 by an Englishman called uh, Thomas Edgar Pemberton, uh, called simply Dickens London. It was this extensive travelogue of walks around sites in Dickens books. And one reviewer in 1876, when it came out, uh, described it as a reverential, but as far as we can see, useless piece of work. What was the point? But from 1880s onwards, certainly from 1880, 1881, what starts a sort of trickle of print material about visiting Dickens London, it becomes a real flood. Um, dozens upon dozens of newspapers, magazine articles, pamphlets, often several books a year. And you see that 
for about 50 years, really, on and off, but, you know, a real massive volume of material. So who was writing all this material about Dickens' London? Um, it's actually a sort of motley assembly of various interested parties, certainly not one person or group. Some were um, literary acolytes of Dickens, like Percy Fitzgerald, who I've pictured there on the right. Um, he, born in 1830, died in 1925. He was one of the young journalists slash authors who Dickens himself encouraged when he was an editor of his own magazines, Household Words, and all the year round. And people like Fitzgerald wrote articles about Dickens London and also their memories of Dickens himself. But there were others, journalists of various sorts. Um, the first sort of article, the first set of print articles, a sort of running set of articles, uh, was by John R. G. Hazard, um, who was literary editor of the New York Tribune. And he came to London in 1879, looked for Dickensian sites, wrote it up in a series of articles in the newspaper, and then published a book. There were professional tour guides, um, a gentleman called Robert Albert, uh, Albert, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, who wrote uh, London Rambles on Zigzag with Charles Dickens, which came out in 1886. He was working for uh, a London travel agency. And there was also what the newspapers slightly satirically dubbed the Dickens cult, by which they meant fans, fandom. Um, and so we have here on the left, William R. Hughes, who was the author of um, A Week's Tramp in Dickens Land, a great collector of first editions and memorabilia to do with Dickens. And also, as it happens, treasurer of the city of Birmingham in the UK as well. So it was, you know, it was his hobby, essentially. And we have with him um, Frederick Kitten, who was an author and illustrator by trade, um, but also a great Dickensian. He wrote Dickens and his illustrators, a uh, bibliography of Dickensiana. And I, I've also pictured it because I just love this illustration. This is um, the cartoon here is Joseph Ashby Sturry, who was a journalist. I suspect quite a well-to-do, um, independently wealthy journalist. He had a very had a flat overlooking Trafalgar Square, which wasn't easily accomplished necessarily. Um, but he also wrote lots of pieces of Dickens, uh, Dick, Dickens' London journalism, rather amateurish poetry about Dickens' London as well, which we perhaps won't go into. He contributed to Punch, um, and he was also credited in his obituary um, with inventing the term Dickensian. Apparently, before he came up with that, um, Dickensonian was the term that some people were using. I, I find it hard to believe that would have caught on, but nevertheless. So you have all these characters who are producing all this Dickens um, top topographical literature, but it's not just literature. Um, there were, as I saw already hinted, a range of sort of tours and tour guides. Um, an interesting one is the Ladies Guides Association who were founded in the late 1880s by a lady called Elizabeth, sorry, Edith, Edith A. Davis. Um, and they basically provided uh, female guides for unaccompanied female visitors to the capital, often for Americans, not always, of course, but often. And it, the Female Guides Association, Lady Guides Association, boasted amongst um, its guides, uh, gentle, intelligent gentlewomen who were, quote, acquainted with every single place of which mention is made in the great novelist's work. Um, so, yes, they, they took the, their female visitors, especially from the States, around Dickens, London, in the late 1880s. They also were doing tours of Jack the Ripper's London as early as 1890, if you can believe. So those two have always gone hand in hand. Um, there were public speakers, a good deal of public speakers. I, I pictured here um, a gentleman called Frank Oates Rose, who was speaking in New York in the late 1880s on Through London with Dickens, uh, accompanied by magic lantern slides. And these sort of slideshow performances of places in, in Victorian London um, were very popular actually. They went around, people went around the country as one of the often these were lantern show proprietors who had various sets of slides they would tour with, but it would be um, Dickensian slides were very popular. There was a film producer from the silent era called Cecil Hepworth who was involved in making Dickens films in the in, in 1910s, 1920s, and his father had been a um, tourer of magic, magic lantern slides, and Hepworth fondly remembered one set called The Footprints of Charles Dickens. And there were indeed films. There was a film made in 1912, Silence, obviously, uh, Leaves from the Books of Charles Dickens, uh, which showed key sites in London. Um, and the, 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 the film star dressed as Dickens characters at each of these sites. Um, there was also, a, that doesn't survive sadly, but there's also a surviving film called simply Dickens London from 1924. And certainly if you're in the UK, you can track that down on the British Film Institute uh, website, the BFI player, you can actually watch it as well. And there were other sort of various pieces, sort of visual media and ephemera um, 
associated with Dickens on there. So on the, on the right of this slide, these are all cigarette cards. There were at least two, I think possibly three sets, extensive sets of collectible uh, cigarette cards showing Dickensian places. I think the one on the right is from the um, 1930s, the last set. So all this was incredibly popular, interest in Dickensian place, places in London in particular, although it extended far beyond London to Kent and elsewhere, but particularly London, um, was very popular until it sort of tapers off in the late 1920s. I'll perhaps say a little about why later on, but um, I, there's a couple of places I want to talk about in this lecture. Just, I should just say, looking at, this, looking at this slide, I'm not going to talk about it much, but the image on the left is um, a photograph of the white, that what remained of uh, the White Hart Inn, which features in the Pickwick Papers, where Mr. Pickwick meets Sam Weller. Um, there was a real inn, and there were several photographs taken up just before it was demolished. And it had turned rather seedy at this point. The ground floor, I don't think you can see it on this slide, had been converted into a, a little sort of shed for a bacon dryer. Uh, it wasn't very smart or glamorous, but other places would be. But anyway, so I, I mentioned that in passing. So all this stuff happening with Dickens and Dickens London after his death, very much from the early 1880s onwards. Um, what I want to talk about in this talk, basically, I'm going to pick on two particular locations and sort of talk about them in detail and, and kind of sum up. I won't, I won't be too long. So I think no guesses for the first place I'm going to talk about. Um, London Bridge, and in particular what became known as Nancy's Steps. Now, we need a little background here, I think, which is why I put these different different versions of the bridge up. There were, there were essentially, there have been essentially, give or take, four versions of old London, of London Bridge. You know? And we start with old London Bridge, which lasted for roughly 500 years or so, from the 1200s to sort of the mid 18th century. Um, that was the bridge that famously had, ultimately had houses built upon it. Um, and... It was a small, it was a narrow medieval bridge that managed to last for 500 years. So it did well, and um, that's top left. And then that bridge was replaced in the mid 18th century um, by as a revised version. The old bridge wasn't entirely demolished, but some of the central section was knocked through to create a new larger arch to allow for sort of bigger river traffic, which was a big issue. Uh, all the houses and stuff had been cleared by then and very quaint sort of Georgian alcoves uh, now top the bridge. And you get that from the 1760s. That bridge in turn survives to the 1830s, to 1831, um, when it's replaced by a Victorian, or not quite Victorian, but 19th century bridge uh, by John Rennie. And that bridge um, survives till 1967, when it's knocked down in the early 70s. Uh, you see the modernist bridge, which still survives to this day. So these are the sort of four incarnations of London Bridge. And we just need to mention that before we talk about Nancy's steps in, in Oliver Twist and as a tourist destination. So it was after the building of the third bridge there, the bottom left one, the one that opened in 1831, uh, that Oliver Twist is published. And of course, it features a key scene where Nancy um, meets Rose, meets Rose May, <laughs> get my right again, Re meet Rose Maley and Mr. Brownlow um, on the bridge and discloses um, the sort of secrets of um, Fagan and Sykes, all of his persecutors to them. And she does this on the steps of the bridge, um, descending down to the river. Now, on the left, you have it as depicted in the, in the novel by Cruikshank, the illustration from the novel. And on the right, you have the actual steps as seen at the end of uh, the 19th century. And those steps, that site uh, became known as Nancy's Steps in honor of this meeting, and it became of particular interest of Dickensian tourists, it became a tourist attraction in itself. The popularity of this site, however, I would argue, reflected not only sort of the descriptive power of Dickens's prose and this interesting sort of illustration which you would have seen in the book, but it also reflects, if you read the original Oliver Twist, the novel, it reflects the amount of sort of imaginative effort which Dickens lavishes on this scene in the novel, something I want to talk about before we go any further. In particular, I think it's, it's worth pausing and sort of asking, why does this scene in the novel actually take place on London Bridge as opposed to anywhere else? Because the book is full of topographical detail. If you read it, um, so the final journey of Oliver's sort of initial trip into London, where he meets the Artful Dodger and then, you know, goes and meets Fagan, um, that's described so precisely in the book uh, in a series of streets um, that you could actually trace the progress on a street atlas of the period if you had it. So Dickens is quite particular about the locality. So why do these characters meet on London Bridge? It's not obvious. Um, Nancy has no particular ties to the district. 
Um, even the Thebes final haunt at Jacob's Island, that sort of Riverside Creek um, at the end of the book on the south bank of the Thames, certainly, but it's a good mile downstream from uh, London Bridge. Elsewhere, we see Nancy in Saffron Hill at Fagin's Den, which was a notoriously criminal part of London, so that, that makes sense. Uh, we see her in Whitechapel again, sort of the East End underworld. And then she meets Rose Maley in the West End to, to talk to her initially before they have this next meeting on the bridge. And it's actually there at that meeting in the West End that she makes a promise to Rose that she will make herself available uh, to meet Mr. Brownlow. I quote, every Sunday night from 11 until the clock strikes 12, I will walk on London Bridge if I am alive. Well, you might say, what of it? This is a perfectly reasonable public spot for Nancy to be there. But I think there's a lot more going on. I mean, for a start, Dickens frames this meeting as if it's a sort of fairy tale almost. There's this promise that binds Nancy uh, to London Bridge on the stroke of midnight, or until the stroke of midnight. It's, it's echoes of Cinderella there. And if you read the text, the, the bridge itself, when sort of Brownlow and Rose Maley, Rose Maley draw up to it, it becomes this place of sort of intense Gothic foreboding. There's a mist um, that rises up from the river. The warehouse, warehouses have lumbering shapes, like sort of monsters beside the bank, um, you know, beside these impossibly dark waters of the Thames. And then he, he talks of the old churches on either side of, of the bridge being giant warders of the metropolis. And there's echoes there of, of Gog and Magog, who were the ancient giants associated with the city of London. And there's a hint that the bridge, even the city, is perhaps some kind of prison. And then the bells of St. Paul toll uh, for the death of another day. So it's all getting very gloomy. And the bridge, in other words, for a brief moment, becomes this sort of weird, deathly metropolis, the very heart of it, sort of weird, deathly metropolis, a place of giants and monsters. And there's even a gloomy forest of ships, masts, and it's all very gothic and over the top. And then Dickens goes even further. He says, well, this happens at the witching hour. And, and again, just a lovely quote here. Midnight had come upon the crowded city, the palace, the night cellar, the jail, the madhouse, the chambers of birth and death, of health and sickness, the rigid face of the corpse and the calm sleep of the child. Midnight was upon them all. Now he's putting a lot of work in here, imaginatively, you know, there's a lot going on. And of course, Dickens himself used to sit on Old London Bridge as a child, the medieval bridge that was demolished in the late 1820s. When his family was in the Marshall Sea Jail in 1824, when his father uh, was, had been imprisoned for debt, he would wait for the prison to open and tell stories to the family's young skibby from the Chatham uh, workhouse. And as David Copperfield, his alter ego, puts it, because he, he uses that scene in David Copperfield, his real life experience, he said, the orphling, the orphan in other words, met me here sometimes to be told some astonishing fictions respecting the wharves and the tower. So London Bridge, at the very least, had a certain personal association, a certain personal magic for Dickens. It's this spot when he first began to conjure with the buildings of London as a sort of scaffold and stimulus for his own imagination. But I would argue, actually, that in this meeting, putting Nancy in this meeting on the bridge, um, he's doing something else as well. He's forging not only a link to his own past, uh, but to the more public past. He's linking Nancy to a sort of gloomy, gothic, imagined past of old London. But London Bridge in the 1830s was undoubtedly modern. It was this bridge, new bridge that had been built by Rennie. Um, it had these wide landing stairs, you can see on the right here, going down to the bank to which Nancy takes Brownlow, Brownlow and Maley. But Dickens, you know, in, in that ornate sort of bit of language I've talked about, he turns into a weird Gothic nightmare. And I think that's because he wants to paint Nancy and by association Sykes and Fagin as part of a sort of long-standing curse that lurks between beneath modern London, a sort of brutal, primitive old London, a city of poverty, of criminality and ignorance. So this sort of gothic reimagining of London Bridge is very deliberate. It's about conjuring up a brutal past and implying that it's far from vanished. And there's other associations working here as well. So the, the steps now down to the river, for instance, were a notorious spot for suicides. Um, and of course, Nancy's meeting with Brownlow is a suicidal move. We know um, that she she herself associates the this with the possibility of meeting some kind of brut brutal punishment at the hands of Sykes. Um, London Bridge itself also, if you remember the picture we looked at, actually didn't notice it, had used to have in the medieval period, had traitors heads on spikes um, placed there. And this is Nancy's treachery, of course. There were other associates, London Bridge, um, the steps down to the river was a notorious place the nuisance of public urination, believe it or not. 
And of course, you had the stench of the polluted Thames as well. And Nancy refers to herself as this, as a creature of, quote, the alley in the gutter. So she's leading them down in sort of this polluted, gloomy underworld of the sort of the criminal class. There's so much going on here. Um, so London Bridge is not this sort of chance scenic location in the bridge. It's a place of pollution, a place of treachery, a place of death. It's at the heart of the capital. It's a somewhere where good and evil can sort of meet and interact between East and West, past and present. It's a place that's above ground, but when you go down the steps, it's below ground as well. You have the sort of heaven and hell aspect to it. There's just an astonishing amount of imaginative weight placed on this. And it's worth noting that there was a period um, when the new bridge built by Rennie and the old medieval bridge coexisted. Um, we see this on, this on this print from around about, I think, 1830. Um, and it's speculation on my part, but Dickens would have seen these two together. And I can't help thinking this mixture of the old and new encouraged him to write this weird Gothic passage of the old impinging on the modern, which has so much resonance for him. So all this energy, all this diverse associations and so on, it made it a very memorable location, I think, for readers. Um, and of course, we have Crookshank's illustration in the book as well, which undoubtedly helps. And perhaps unsurprisingly then, um, Nancy Steps, as it became known, uh, became a real destination for tourism. So the key printed work for Nancy Steps becoming a place for literary tourists is by that, that mustachioed gentleman I showed you earlier, Joseph Ashby Sterry, Ashby Sterry, a journalist. And it was called Dickens in Southwark, and it appeared in a magazine um, in 1888. And he says in the, in the text, descend to the steps by the... So he's enjoining readers to do this, telling readers to do this. Descend the steps to the river hard by the Bridge House Hotel, and you will find yourself in the exact spot with precisely the scenery of half a century ago of the interview between Nancy, Rose Maley, and Mr Brownlow. And if you go there at 12 o'clock on a dark night, you will realise the picture to perfection. So this article is particularly interesting for me because it sort of epitomises the appeal of literary tourism. It's like a guided tour. He, lead, he describes all the, Ashby Sterry describes these places, but he tells you how to find them. It's sort of um, also, an, an, it offers at least a possibly a sort of an informative antiquarian experience. You can see all London, you know, as it used to be, even now you can step back in time on London Bridge. For Ashby Sterry also, it's kind of a prompt for memories of Dickens and his work. He talks about how he used to go to uh, Dickens's public readings, and particularly his readings of uh, Sykes and Nancy, which was like his great dramatic performance, and that he recalls that as well. He talks about how you can reimagine the scene from the book yourself. You can lurk on the bridge and actually picture the characters sort of in front of you if you stand there. It's like a virtual reality experience. And he says characters should lurk around the pilaster at the bottom of the flight of stairs and play at being Noah Claypole, i.e. the spy in the book who spies on this scene. And, you know, visit at midnight for the full experience. Um, so there's all this stuff going on. And actually, interestingly, the image that's used in the book, if you can see it here on the left, um, sort of emphasises this sort of virtual experience. The text sort of merges into the image and back and forth. There's these sort of blurred faces on the image as well, which is different from the original Crookshank illustration. And I think that's because he's inviting us to sort of superimpose our own imagination on it, to sort of picture the scene for ourselves. So there's, there's nothing there. We have to fill in the blanks, as it were, of those, of those faces. Um, and, you know, the figure of Claypole lurking at the front, this, this spy of Fagin's, is kind of a proxy for us. We, we become Claypole and we stare at this scene. And there's a real sort of dreamlike quality to the image of him as well, I think. So I think all this echoes, Ashley Sterry's article actually echoes Dickens' own idea of the bridge as sort of this place between uh, different worlds. You know, we're bridging the gap between reality and fiction. So his article definitely kicks off the interest in Nancy's steps as a locality. But of course, it wasn't just articles, although a good few would follow. Um, for instance, this is a promotional poster for the 1905 stage adaptation of Oliver Twist uh, by Herbert Beerbohm, Beerbohm Tree, famous actor of the period. And the stage adaptation had a very elaborate set for this meeting, quote, of a particularly striking and massive character. Uh, and basically the, the bridge stretched over, representation, representation of the bridge stretched over the whole stage and you had this sort of watery forefront and the characters on the stage. This is, a, this is a picture of roughly what it looked like on the stage. It was a promotional poster, but roughly what it looked like on the stage. Um, and I think this is suggestive, but this was used as the, you know, the main promotional po poster for Oliver Twist. It's suggestive how well-known Nancy's steps were, I think, to the public by this stage. 
both the real steps and the, you know, the scene in the book was very familiar to the reading public at the turn of the 20th century. So you would see, you see this place also represented on stage. And I think that's that kind of reciprocal relationship. The, the real world tourist site boosts the stage, you know, and vice versa, the stage sends people to the real world tourist site. And of course, it would also appear in cinema. This is the 1922 film of Low Twist uh, with Lon Chaney as Fagan and Jackie Coogan as Oliver. I think, oh, I say Oliver, is it Oliver or is he Dodger? Oh, forgive me, my knowledge of that film is not great. Someone can correct me later on. Um, so yes, it definitely appears in most film adaptations. Elsewhere as well, this is the real steps, um, but used in a, as a promotional image for the Tabard players. Now the Tabard players were a 1920s and 30s amateur theatrical group who, group who made a performance every year in honor of Dickens' birthday outside the George Inn in, in Southwark, not too far from here but they also produce various sort of publicity material. And here they are posing on um, the steps as depicted in the novel and the Crookshanks and so on. And of course, the steps also feature in David Lean's 1946 film, Oliver Twist. Although he does something very interesting with London Bridge. He doesn't use any, these are, these are stage sets. He doesn't use the real bridge. And if you look at the film, um, the balustrade, I haven't pictured it here, but the balustrade, the first scene in the film when they're on the main bridge proper and you see them against the balustrade of the bridge, at the, the edge of the side of the bridge, the balustrade is massive, it dwarfs the characters. And then when they come down the steps, look at the size of those stones. They're like pyramid sized stones. They aren't the size of stones you'd see on a bridge in London, they're gigantic. And so Lin, Lean plays with this sort of set design to create this air, air of uncanniness but having everything just too giant, the characters are really dwarfed in the London Bridge scenes. It's quite, it's quite peculiar and unusual. I don't know if anyone's really thought about it, but it definitely creates this slightly uncanny feel, I think. But anyway, you know, it remained a tourist destination. Um, I think there was a signboard put up for the uh, for, for 1951, for the, the South Bank Festival then. People came and looked for it. Um, and they appeared in even a TV documentary in 1967. Um, but of course, also in 1967, it was no more. London Bridge... Famously, Rennie's Bridge was demolished and shipped wholesale uh, to the United States and re-erected as a tourist attraction at Lake Havasu in Arizona. Now, you might think, well, OK, that was great. Therefore, Nancy's steps disappeared uh, in 1967 when they went to Arizona. Well, the steps didn't actually go to Arizona, only the bridge. And uh, they didn't quite disappear, because if you go to London Bridge today, you'll find something altogether different. Um, a plaque which says these steps and arch are surviving fragments of the 1831 London Bridge designed by Rennie. These steps were the scene of the murder of Nancy in Charles Dickens's novel, Oliver Twist. Now I suspect you have to think twice about that, but I think most people listening to this will probably know, but may not, because it's not obvious when you start thinking, that's just wrong. It's actually wrong in two ways. First of all, these aren't the same steps to start with. If you remember the steps I showed you early on, they led down to the riverside. They were quite wide, wide enough in the Crookshank illustration to have a, a waterman's boat hauled up on them. These are very narrow and so that they're not like that. And of course, Nancy in the novel is not murdered on the steps at all. It's a hideous scene of domestic violence with Bill Sykes um, out of the way entirely. Now this plaque is there though. It's actually wholly unofficial. No one knows exactly who puts it there. It appeared in 2019 um, after having said that, an identically worded plaque disappeared. And that was that was produced by Southern Council probably some 15, 20 years earlier. Why is it so oddly wrong? Well, I think we all probably know the reason, actually. Um, Lionel Bart's 1960s musical, Oliver, particularly, of course, the cinematic version directed by Carol Reed in 1968, stitches together disparate parts of the original narrative into this sort of fast-paced finale and in that finale Nancy dies upon the steps. So you could argue in fact that this plaque is not quite wrong in some it's, it's more it's more mis, it's more indicative than misleading perhaps because many people are familiar with Oliver Swiss mainly frankly from that film and for anyone who's only seen the film that very much is the place where Nancy is murdered. You know Oliver Swiss much like A Christmas Carol as the various Dickens scholars have said you know it's a novel that sort of transcended its literary beginnings and they become part of a sort of collective imagination through adaptation and, and so on. Um, and so we have now this odd plot, which is slightly wrong, but nevertheless, I think it shows a desire not to lose track of bits of Dickensian heritage. Um, you know, so much so that the steps have almost been resurre resurrected really in this new location. And I think it's also significant that the steps uh, are quite sort of narrow, 
dark and sort of they're not dark in this shot, but you see them leaving, and they're quite narrow and crooked, and they look old, you know. And I think they are at least a sort of link to the topographic distillation of, of Dickens novels that lurks in our head, a sort of generalised idea of Dickens' London, they, even though they bear little relation to the steps described in the novel. And, you know, it's quite curious that Dickens' London has this sort of overall city of the imagination, which is kind of bigger than any particular location. The steps look Dickensian in the sort of broadest sense. Um, and, you know, I think that shows that that sort of sense of Dick Dickens' London, amassed from the novels, but also from the numerous film adaptations and so on, um, is actually capable of creating almost new Dickensian localities, because here, here we have one. And this brings me to my second uh, location, which, believe it or not, was actually the biggest Dickens tourist attraction at the start of um, 20th century. This was the old curiosity shop, um, just off Lincoln's Inn Fields and Portsmouth Street, Holborn. This is a particularly eerie glimpse of it uh, from a photograph from the Dickens Museum. Um, but of course, it's still there to this day. I'll show you some other pictures shortly. Dickens describes the old curiosity shop in the book, thus, one of those receptacles for old and curious things which seem to crouch in odd corners of this town and hide their musty treasures from the public eye in jealousy and distrust. There were suits of mail standing like ghosts in armour here and there, fantastic carvings brought from monkish cloisters, rusty weapons of various kinds, distorted figures in china and wood and iron and ivory, tapestry. I lost the Wi-Fi furniture. a bit, but it's that still going on. designed in dreams. So the novel, at least, in making this description, um, it's partly a sort of, the novel at least rather, I should say, is partly overall a sort of allegory. It's not, it's not necessarily about specific places. It's partly at least an allegory about 19th century capitalism. Um, and actually strikingly, all that stuff we hear about in the curiosity shop, those suits of armor and so on, we see them in the church where little Nell ultimately sort of finds peace and death at the end of the book. Uh, but in a situation where instead of being these sort of nightmarish historical artifacts ripped from where they belong, they provide a sort of stimulus for moral tales of the past. So the story this, has this overall sort of allegorical arc to it. And it's far from clear actually that Dickens was thinking about any kind of particular real world shop. Indeed, he concludes the novel um, by stating that the shop in question has been demolished. Um, it's been removed by streets, been redeveloped. And it's almost as if at the end, you know, he throws this in and says, look, just don't bother looking for a specific place. This is, you won't find it. The only clue, if it, if it was based on a particular shop, um, to the shop's exterior in the book, is a drawing uh, by a physics illustrator, which shows a decaying townhouse, a sort of Georgian or Oldham, probably no older than Georgian, actually, probably 15th, 16th century townhouse, um, with a quaint porch. Uh, and it's a far cry from this shop at Portsmouth Street, which I'll say I'll show you another picture of in a minute, which became known as the Old Christie Shop. So it's quite surprising then that this shop on Portsmouth Street, this squat Tudor building with no resemblance to the book's illustrations or even the description in the book, nor any connection to Dickens particularly, as far as I can make out, would become known as the Old Curiosity Shop. And until the opening of the Dickens Museum, this was, believe it or not, the most popular Dickensian attraction in London. You can measure it in postcards. Go on, go on to eBay and look for Old Curiosity Shop and you will find dozens upon dozens of different commercial images of this premises. Collectibles as well, you get collectible money boxes, mustard pots, you name it, showing the old Christie shop. Uh, this building was even reproduced at World's Fairs in the 1930s, versions of it. So a version of it appeared, uh, was remade at the Merry England Zone of the 1933 Chicago Century of Progress exhibition, alongside remakes of also parts of the Tower of London and a recreated Shakespeare's Globe. It was a really iconic English venue for people. So how did this ob obscure little shop with no other connection to Dickens, in fact, come to be this sort of tourist attraction? Well, partly it was Dickens' own vagueness. There, there was no clear description of place and uh, locality in the book. And you hear from by the 1870s, pretty much every antique shop in London uh, claims to be the original of Dickens' old curiosity shop for obvious commercial reasons, particularly uh, with visiting tourists. But what happened at this building in, in Holborn is that uh, Mr. Tessiman, the owner of this shop, in the 1870s, actually painted the words, the old curiosity shop in this sort of Gothic script on the facade. This wasn't a particularly exciting shop. Uh, one account of it describes it as having cheap relics of antiquarian interest, most especially the autographed letters of famous actors. The whole store of the books 
was never worth five shillings altogether, the shabbiest collection of insignificant old volumes in the raggedest and dirtiest condition. But nonetheless, this shop will be pictured in a US magazine article in 1881, which described it as a fake, a quote, pardonable, albeit misguided desire on the part of the poverty-stricken neighbor to lift itself uh, into an easy and inexpensive notoriety. But the picture was the picture, and people liked the look of it. This is the picture you can see on the left, They're quite hazy, but nevertheless, it seemed quaint. Tourists began to seek it out. There was American tourists coming into London in this period, and they began to seek it out. And the next owner, Mr. Poole, um, added a second line underneath uh, the old curiosity shop. He added the words, immortalized by Charles Dickens. And so if we see it here on the right, sort of in its first incarnation, probably about 1900. And then you'll notice actually that the script changes slightly. This was because the shop was refurbished about, about 1929. So the bottom one has a slightly different script to it. So you get this, this sort of text added onto the front. And actually what happens also is in 1883, so not long afterwards, um, journalists began to report on people coming to see it because there was a, a threat of demolition. Um, the Metropolitan Board of Works, the sort of overarching body for doing building work in London, was about to build a new road. And it was threatened that this so-called old job shop would disappear. And tourists were this, this disappearing, we have to go and see it. And there was a sort of flock of people to it, crowds of people. Um, there's a report from 1883 which says they went there to worship, a neighbouring shopkeeper said, took off their hats when they got through the doorway and asked questions about Quilp and the grandfather as if they'd been actual persons. The ladies were worst. I have known them get down upon their knees and burst out crying about Little Nell. So people are investing quite heavily in this building, which had no connection to Dickens in particular at all. Was it quite that intense? I don't know. There one thing you notice reading about Dickens London is that many British sources like to talk about these oversightable Americans, you know, coming over here, weeping at Nickel Nell. I wouldn't necessarily take it entirely seriously, but there was a great deal of publicity. The building, um, if it wasn't famous already, it became a lot more famous. Um, why was it so fascinating to people? I think, well, bluntly, for a start, it looked old, um, which appealed to tourists in general. Tudor slash Elizabethan buildings like this sort of quaint old cottage fitted into sort of heritage vision of old London or old England that emerged in the late 19th century. A sort of particular vision of quaint antiquity that appealed to tourists. This is part of an advert from the um, about 1912, I think, actually, probably put out by Cunard. And, you know, no, no country is richer in relics of a storied past. And Dickens, uh, you know, was part of this overall heritage package. Um, the shop's crooked roof, I think, was particularly appealing. Visitors were very fond of crookedness. Henry James, the author, once described Chester, the ancient city of Chester, as possessing a perfect feast of crookedness. And he suggested that it was England's ancient crooked buildings that produced such a vigorous imagination in writers like Dickens. And Dickens himself might have even agreed when he visited America in the 1840s and saw the sort of new cities being laid out in grid form. He was not happy. He said of Phil Philadelphia, I would have given the world for a crooked street. Um, the building also, it pleased tourists, I think, because it was fairly obscure. It was set back from main roads. You had to know where it was to find it, which tied into a sort of perception, I think, of Dickens London as sort of mysterious and labyrinthine. And actually, if you look at, if you read Dombey and Son, another book by Dickens, Although this looks nothing like the, the shop described in, in the old ghosty shop, it looks quite like actually the shop of Sol Gills in Dombey and Son. It has the overhanging sort of timber, timber upper story. And so it looks like the sort of building that might fit into a sort of Dickensian milieu. It's also, it was always also looked look remarkably different from its neighbours. It sort of stuck, sort of stuck out. It was, you know, it was a striking sight. Um, and it was also rather sort of quaint and compact. It had its antique appearance, but it also, its size was particularly sort of cute and quaint, and which enabled it to be reproduced in various forms. I've mentioned sort of these images of it. There were, there were even from the early 1880s, there were wood blocks with the shop painted on the front. And then later you get, you know, not only various illustrations, but things like tins, mustard pots, honey pots, door knockers. It had a certain, you know, compact, quaint appeal. And you know, the building itself appears oddly miniature. It's, it's a small cottagey type building. And as the academic Susan Stewart has said, the, the miniature is a device for fantasy. It's associated with dreams of ownership and display 
it's a building upon which you could project really a fantasy of old London and a Dickens London. And I think most important thing perhaps is also that facade that um, the writing on the facade, those Gothic letters. Um, Wordsworth in book seven of the Prelude is a great epic poem, um, describes London's sort of overwhelming assembly of sights and signs. And he talks about names emblazoned on shops, which act as a sort of title page uh, for the shop as if the shop were a book. And in the case of the old curiosity shop, the facade does resemble the title of a novel. It's the old curiosity shop by Charles Dickens. It's almost there on the front of the shop. And so, you know, it creates this weird association with the book, the novel, and the author. Um, and the very presence of the sign, of course, that authenticates the shop itself. You know, the fact it has this arresting Gothic lettering, this claim to be immortalized by Charles Dickens, gives it this sort of historical authenticity and importance. And I think the facade, the facade and, that, and that sort of lettering has always been its actually, ironically, sort of most important feature of all. And, you know, the shop went on to appear like Nancy Steps, it would appear in film. There were two silent versions of the old curiosity shop uh, in 1913 and 1921, which actually used original locations, particularly this shop, even though this wasn't the shop in the book, but they used it because it was well known as it. Um, it appeared in the film I mentioned earlier called Dickens London, a sort of tour of Dickensian sites. Here we see a spectral little Nell and her grandfather emerging uh, from the real world shop. Again, the tabard players, the people who posed on those steps down to the bridge, they did one of their performances. I don't think many, I think maybe just one year outside the old curiosity shop building itself. So here is a performance of the old curiosity shop outside the old curiosity shop. And as I sort of alluded to earlier, the building was so well known in the sort of turn of the 20th century and, and those years, it was reproduced at um, expos, exhibitions in, in America, three or four of them. Uh, and here we see the first one at Chicago. Um, and, it, you know, the lettering and so on, it's a reproduction of that shop in Holborn. And on the left here is a photo I found in the Dickens Museum. So it says, uh, can I read it? It's, yes, members of the Dickens Fellowship at the Chicago Exhibition of, of Progress, 1934. So I don't know which, which branch of the Dickens Fellowship they were. If anyone wants to track them down face by face, it's an amazing picture. You have to marvel at the, the power of old photographs to evoke sort of, you know, I'd love to sort of dwell on each face in there individually. But anyway, the, you know, this famous shop in Holborn with no connection to Dickens, let me stress that there's no known connection to Dickens whatsoever. Because of that inscription, the power of that inscription, um, it becomes incredibly famous. It's famous, you know, if you were coming to the UK from the States in the early 1900s, you would certainly go to Windsor, Tower Bridge, Buckingham Palace. You would also go to the Old Curiosity Shop. It was, it was that famous. And of course, that fame diminished partly due to the um, appearance of the Dickens Museum in 1925. And, you know, there are, there are fashions in tourism, I guess, as much as anything else. So to conclude what, I, I am getting, what time are we? I, I am getting towards concluding. I've gone longer than I thought I would, sorry. Um, what does this tell us about why, what does all this tell us, and this is all an excerpt of stuff I've looked at in the book, but what does it tell us about why people visited Dickensian sites at the turn of the 20th century? I think some of the things are quite obvious. You know, there was an element of hero worship. There was this cult of sort of posthumous literary tourism, um, which dated back to the romantics as well. You know. It, it, in this sort of early, early 19th century, people were looking at the graves of famous authors, and that extended to places described in their books. So you get people in the early 19th century were looking around Wordsworth's Lake District or Walter Scott's Scotland. So it was a continuation of that in a sense. Um, after Dickens had died, he was sort of sent to this sort of the, the great national pantheon in, in Westminster Abbey, and I think his death definitely contributed to also the interest in Dickens' London. I think we can also look at the power of Dickens' description of place, his ability to illustrate things verbally, and then the illustrations by the likes of Cruikshank and Fizz in the books. And also, I think, overlook the power of theatrical adaptations, which I sort of alluded to as well. They create interest in, in places. And I think there's an irony, actually, that the real world place becomes for tourists a sort of illustration of the book. So, you know, it's both the original place that Dickens took some inspiration from, but then when you go and visit it, it's kind of an illustration of the place, or in, in another illustration of the place in your imagination in the book. The Victorians were also, certainly in the late 19th century in particular, fascinated with history, um, with recreating the past on stage, in books, elsewhere. And, you know, visualising scenes from the books in situ was very much like stepping back into the past, as Ashby Sterry said about the steps of London Bridge. You know, step down here and you'll see Dickens' London, the, the London of 50 years ago. And it's no coincidence, I think, that Dickens' London, you know, talking about this historical fascination, Dickens' London 
emerged at the same time as, say, the old London street. You see this on the left here. This was at the International Health Exhibition of 1884, a massively popular theme park-like reconstruction of pre-1666 buildings from the city of London. So it was like a walk through medieval world. It was all created from scratch in an exhibition. Um, and, you know, the appeal of sort of stepping back in time into that sort of reconstructed world, I think also was very similar to the sort of virtual experience you perhaps experience in Dickens land. And of course, this recreated medieval world anticipated, perhaps prefigured, the sort of generalized, non-specific sort of recreations of Dickens London that would appear in a film later in the 20th century. So I have here a um, back, background scene to Oliver the Musical, um, I don't know if you remember that set. And then even, dare I say, the Dickens world of Chatham, I recreate a Dickens in theme park, which flourished until oh, about 10 years ago, I think, in um, Chatham and Kent. When I say flourished, that may be a slight exaggeration. I think Nancy's steps and particularly that erroneous plant we talked about and the old curiosity shop, this sort of invented Dickens in Paris locality, you know, speak to that idea also that I've sort of alluded to earlier that historic places are not many just sort of catalogued. Um, they're crafted to meet the demands of tourists as they come to meet them. Um, and, you know, Dickens land just didn't exist. It was manufactured by writers, uh, by people producing, you know, cigarette cars, you name it. And there's this sort of feedback loop created in, in that process, which we've seen in the old curiosity shop. Now, Dickens himself, ironically, and ironically, cleverly enough, I think is the word, was, was I think, quite aware of this. Um, Juliet John, who, Professor Juliet John, who was my PhD supervisor, she kept asking me to look at a little section of Barnaby Rudge, and I couldn't work out for the life of me. Eventually, I got around to looking at it. Um, and it's a section in Barnaby Rudge, Dickens' historical novel, regarding a mountain block, just this piece of stone where you get on your horse outside the old Maypole Inn in the first, first chapter of uh, Barnaby Rudge. And it has a legend attached to it, attached to it that it, this, this mountain block, this bit of stone, we're told, was once used by Queen Elizabeth I. I'm going to read out what Dickens says here. He says in the novel, the matter of fact and doubtful folks, of whom there were a few amongst the Maypole customers, the, the pub, which was outside, uh, were inclined to look on this tradition, i.e. that Elizabeth had used this mountain block, as rather apocryphal. But whenever the landlord of this ancient hostelry appealed to the mountain block itself as evidence, and triumphantly pointed out that he stood there in that same place to that very day, the doubters never failed to be put down by a large majority and all true believers exalted as in a victory. And what, what he's pointing out here is what um, Juliet sort of talks of these things being mutually constitutive, I think she says. It's, it's as if the story gives, gives power to the stone and the stone makes the story plausible. And you see that in Dickens London, I say with the old curiosity shop and elsewhere. You know, the odd objects and the legends sort of mutually reinforce each other. So I'm, I'm drawing to a close now, rest assured. Um, I, I think I said I'd say something why Dickens' tourism sort of peaked in the 1930s. Certainly some of the hero worship diminished. Uh, I think Dickens' literary reputation diminished for various reasons in that period, unjustly. And of course, there's a general feeling after World War II that all things Victorian uh, needed to be replaced by something modern, certainly Victorian buildings. So the interest in Dickens' London there diminished. And, you know, as I sort of hinted, cinema began to provide its own quite alluring version of Dickens' London as a sort of touristic spectacle on, on the big screen. And increasingly, this was a new and better illustration than anything available in the real world, as a lot of the buildings were being, had been demolished or destroyed during the war. And, you know, less and less of it appeared. And there are fashions and tourism as well, I guess. Um, but Dickens' London is still sort of there. Um, it's still there in small pieces, waiting to be explored, even though there's not so much of it. This is the revived old curiosity shop. It's recently been um, refitted by London School of Economics, which now owns basically the whole area it's in. It wasn't demolished because it was listed in the 1950s um, on account of its literary associations. So hedging their bets there, English heritage, um, carefully treading over the fact that it has no real association with Dickens. But it doesn't matter because people have visited it for, you know, 78 years or so. You know. So that dubious writing on the facade, um, that fake title page on the building, and all the visitors that followed it, ironically, ultimately preserved uh, the building itself. So yes, there you go. That's my brief romp through Dickens Land, the curious history of Dickens London. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. This is this was a wonderful talk, and Thank you. Uh, um, I I hope that. Uh, um, there will be questions from the audience. If you 
have questions, please uh, indicate by using the raised hand function at the bottom of your screen. And you may also put questions or comments in the chat and my colleague Renee will uh, monitor the chat and uh, uh, intervene as necessary. So, uh, Lee, can we stop your screen sharing so that we so that people can see each other? Yes, that would be a good. Yes, idea. of course. Um, do you need to? Can you stop it, or do I need to stop it? I think you I, need to stop it. I need to stop it. Okay, I can. I can probably okay. manage that. We'll wait. Um, we'll wait until the. Uh... Hang on. If I. Hmm. Stop share. There we go. Sorry, I haven't used this for so long. There we go. Yes. Okay. Very good. Very good. So we have a question from Carrie Frederick. Carrie, please uh, go ahead. Make sure you're unmuted. Yeah, actually a comment. I visited Dickens World with my son and really loved it. We were gonna go again 10 years later and it was closed, but it had a wonderful four dimension a version of Dickens giving a, a speech or portraying a scene from A Christmas Carol, something like that. And I thought it was really well done. Yeah, I mean, I, I annoyingly at the time I was I wasn't researching Dickens, so I didn't go, and, I, and then I, you know, a couple of years before I started doing this work, it, it closed. Um, yeah, I, I actually I've spoken to quite a few people who've been, and actually most people came away from it with roughly you know some degree of happiness and pleasure. It it closed I think partly because the any was that an animation of the three D, but I think a couple of people said like there was a great animation. There's a great Dickens life story there. I I think. What killed it probably, and this is just speculation, but um, was the location. It was originally designed to be um, the, the guy who built it was really hoping to put it in King's Cross in pretty much central London. And soaring property prices meant he, he couldn't manage that. So he moved it to Chatham, which obviously has Dickensian associations. But basically you had, an, a, you, had a, you know, a, a, a site which was supposed to be about Dickens London, but wasn't in London, essentially. Um, and so that I think that was difficult for it. And I think also, it struggled a bit in pitching itself to the right audience. Um, the guy who managed it was always saying it wasn't a theme park, it was a themed attraction because it only had one theme park ride essentially. And I think he, he, I think they got mismanaged that side. I mean, it, might, it was open from I think about 2007 to, I want to say 2016, I may be wrong. So it didn't, it didn't actually crash and burn, but it never made money. Um, it was never popular enough to make the money. The only money they made was from the I think the bowling alley and cinema next door, they own the property. So they, they get that kept it going. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's funny. A lot of people I spoke to um, actually really enjoyed it. So, you know, it wasn't awful. I think the one objection to it was perhaps that from what I heard, it, it wasn't much exposure to Dickens language, to his words as, as far as I know. And that's, but then, you know, how do you do that in a walk through 3D work? You know, there's only so much of that you can do. So I don't know. I wish I'd seen it. I, I, I don't know enough about it to comment on it. Um, a lot of people have actually just visited it as visitors have enjoyed it. Academics tended to be a bit more snooty about it. Um, I, I can't form an absolute judgment because I didn't go. I wish I had seen it. Thank you. Um, Kirk, Kirk Davis. Well, Lee, this was a tremendous presentation. And like others have said, we can't wait for the book. Please publish it immediately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question, are you familiar with the... Uh, Harry Potter world that was created by Warner Brothers Studios in London. My niece and I visited it in 2016, and we were blown away with the recreation of the models and the sets and all that kind of thing. Why couldn't such a thing be somewhat successful somewhere in the world today? Yeah, and you know, I mean, that that location, I, have, I haven't been, I must admit, my daughter and my wife have been, uh, they loved it. Um, they were, I say, they were built over, right? I think it's in Watford, isn't it, outside London? So it's not in central London. So that's kind of, you know, now, Watford is actually easier to get to than Chatham. Um, so maybe that's, you know, maybe that's an issue. I don't know why Dickens didn't. So see, I, I guess there wasn't quite as much of the, of the Dickens world as the, you know, the Harry Potter experience. The Harry Potter experience, I suspect, had, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 times more, more money poured into it. And it had that great film franchise, of course, right? Dickens was kind of starting from scratch. Um, it tried, the, the people who've been Dickens world, they tried to link it to TV series. So they certainly... Uh, try to link it to the Dickensian TV series, which is kind of mashup of Dickens's novels. Um, but you know the the vast merchandising power of Harry Potter uh, <laughs> certainly accounts for that. And it's interesting, you know, Dickens London and Jack the Ripper's London, for better or worse, 
used to always be the two sort of walking tours that dominated if you want to go on a tour in London. Now it's very much Harry Potter's London. Um, that is definitely so, you know, again, you know, there are fashions, you know, Harry Potter is, although it's what, how many years old now? I mean, it's 25 years old. Um, but nevertheless, that, that is more current and in people's imagination, I fear, than, than Dickens. But Dickens, of course, that's specific. And who knows? There may yet be uh, another Dickens world or, you know, something like that. People have tried over the years and it'd be interesting to see what you could do with it. I, 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 yeah, I, I'm not against the Dickens theme park. It, it would, it, a good Dickens theme park would be fabulous. You know? Lee, I, I'll ask a, a question, which uh, is about the role of the journal, The Dickensian, in promoting uh, Dickens tourism. And uh, remind me, you, you, I, I can't recall the, the date of the founding of the Dickensian uh, as a journal, which is a, a, a predecessor to what we would today call fanzines. Um, it's, yeah, I guess. It's, it's some, uh, somewhere between. Somewhere between, a, isn't it? It's, it's yeah, funny. I a mean, scholarly so journal the, and, and a fanzine. So. Yeah, I mean, so I, th I, th I may be wrong, but I, the, fellowship, the fellowship certainly is founded in 1902, I think. And yes, I think the Dickensian think starts in 1905. So, you know, fairly short order anyway, after the fellow, mm -hmm. Dickens Fellowship. And the fellowship, if people don't know, is kind of a, it is kind of a worldwide Dickens fan club. You, 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 you paid a shilling, I think, to join to start with, and you would meet up with fellow fans. And... A lot of those meetings, certainly in London anyway, but also around the world, would be about Dickensian plays. Not all of them, but, you know, there a good, a, you know, good proportion. There would be slideshows. Um, the Dickens Fellowship had its own set of Dickens, Dickens London slides, which would rent out to other uh, branches of the Fellowship around, around and about London. Um, they advised on tour guides. If you came to London, you could go to the Fellowship and they'd tell you, you know, where in the say, 1910s, 1920s, they would tell you where to find a tour guide. So the Fellowship was certainly to some degree interested um, in Dickensian place. Um, it was part of the original, it was part of the original sort of, um, what's the word, the sort of terms of the fellowship that they would look into preserving Dickensian sites. Um, but of course the only site they eventually really preserved was the, the museum, the, the 48 Doughty Street, Dickens' home in 1837 to 1830 now, which is now the museum. Um, but they did that incredibly well. They didn't have the money or the funds to preserve anywhere else. If they had, the money, I'm sure they would have bought some other buildings. I mean, it's interesting that Gads Hill Place, the house where Dickens lived in Kent from about 1857 to his death in 1870, that came on the market in 1923 and didn't meet its original auction price. And it was offered to the Dickens Fellowship, but the Fellowship had already committed to buying what's now the Dickens Museum in London. And there was no way they could raise the money to have two Dickens houses. So there was a money issue for them um, as well. And I looked and saw the, the funding of the original Dickens Museum, the Dickens House, as it was first known. And of course, interesting, a lot of the money came from the United States as well. Um, there were some very generous journalists from New York and Long Island in particular, who gave several hundred dollars each, uh, which is quite a lot of money in those days. Um, so yeah, it, it's interesting. I'm, I'm The Dickensian Dickens Fellowship is kind of a fan club, but it's also quite scholarly, which is, which is perverse in a way because Dickens, Dickensian fans and fandom were mocked in the 1880s and 1890s they're being obsessives a bit like you know we typically mock fans generally now right a particular particular tv series or what have books or what have you they were mocked as being obsessive more much more than anyone else um there's a book from 188 from the 1880s about uh again i think it might be by american and it has this typical dickens tour guide who who sees dickens characters in every corner and sort of believes they're actually really alive and then he dashes off to the to the east end because he's he's heard a murder's happened and bill sykes has been at it and it's all this weird and it's it's mocking the, the, the sort of fantasy of, of dickens london and dickens fans imagination um which and the rest of the book is a very straight portrayal of sort of, Dick, of literary territories but then dickens fans you know they're kind of weird and over the top and obsessive so i don't i don't know if anyone here associates with that <laughs> description <laughs> but you definitely see that in the sort of literature about Dickens tourism, um, very much so. Good, good, thank you. Christian. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I was struck, so around the Marshalsea in London, there's also Quilp Road, Little Doric Court, and there's this whole region uh, in Southwark of streets and locations that are named after Dickens and Dickens characters. And so, do you know, does that come after the Nancy Steps? Is it unrelated oh, yeah. to the Nancy Steps? What's happening um, there? Yeah, it's more that sort of council. I, I think most of those, I can't quite pin the date. I think it's late 1920s, early 1930s. Um, 
a lot of those things are sort of the council getting enough money to do a bit of street improvement work, to knock down slum housing and so on. And so they add Dickens name to it. I think the sort of heritage appeal of Dickens as being, you know, a kind of like the patron saint of the, the borough because he had, you know, the Marshalsea was there in particular. Um, and Little Dorrit, you know, the, the book is there as well. Uh, St. George's Church there. And I think there was, you know, before we had sort of kind of like in the modern world of marketing and heritage, but nevertheless, I think I think the council saw that. But I also think it was just in the early 20th century, and especially amongst perhaps older people in the early 20th century, there was such an affection for Dickens's books, um, in particular as being there, having been their childhood reading. I think, you know, Dickens was not a children's author, but he was read extensively and given to children at sort of the turn of the 20th century. And I think a lot of the, and it's certainly the late 19th century. And so I think a lot of the councillors who would have been in Southwark at the time, they had grown up in the 1870s, the 1880s, and Dickens was sort of part and parcel of their childhood. So I think there's a lot of affection there as well. And I think um, there's, a, there's a London tour guide called William Kent, a writer slash tour guide in the 1940s, who laments that he, ha he has um, a sort of adult education group who he gets out to do, and he, he does sort of stuff with Dickens on them. And he says, not, not one of them have read Little Dorrit. He can't believe that there's anyone who's not read Little Dorrit. And he says that he fears that it's because the generation who grew up with Dickens as their sort of default main childhood author, that generation is kind of dying out. And he thinks, uh, you know, the the new generations aren't quite so affectionate. To and of course, it's interesting, you know, the was Dickens being read as much in the 1920s, 1930s? I try, I found looking to another aspect of the book, there was a a Dickens, a, a David Copperfield library built in Somerset Town on um, the site of Johnson Street, Dickens Childhood Home. And it was it was a short-lived affair. It was, it was meant to be like a children's reading library for the poor of Camden. But I, look, I looked at the time, in relation to that, I looked to see if children were reading Dickens. And I found a couple of reports were sort of librarians in the 1920s. And no, the top four boys' books were all action adventure, sort of imperial adventure. I can't remember, is it G.A. Henty? Henty's the surname. And, and various sort of, sort of children's authors. Uh, Dickens was well behind boys' books. Girls Dickens came higher in second or third place, but the librarians thought that, that was only because the girls had been told that Dickens was one of the authors they ought to read and they wanted to impress the interviewer. You know, so I think I think Dickens was generally a childhood author of this late Victorian early 20th century. But then, he, he, you know, as we all know, right, it becomes less fashionable in the early 20th century. So, yeah, I think there was a bit of marketing with Southwark and I think there's a bit of affection. Um, and, you know, it's that, it's that, you know, the Marshall Sea, oh, there's, there's basically nothing left of the Marshall Sea. There's one wall now left of the Marshall Sea. And there's a little more left of it in the early 20s, but not that much. Um, but Dickens, you know, again, it's about how Dickens in, instills places with such sort of imaginative energy. And, you know, the, the Marshall Sea in Little Dorrit, and then in that, you know, that, that extract in Forster's biography where it's basically the same as, you know, um, in David Copperfield and so on. So he, he gives it such energy that I think, so that, you know, it seemed an obvious place to focus on um, those Dickensian names, yeah. And there's, there's some modern housing estates now with, with the, you know, built in like the 1930s and 1950s, yeah. With, with Dickens' characters on them. Yeah, so it's always interesting wandering around so they can see those names for sure. Good. Glenna, I see you have a hand raised. I do indeed. I wanted to make a few comments, actually, if I may. Uh, I want to say first, people in the Dickens uh, circles here have heard me say this before, but I feel like in a way I had a Victorian childhood because my parents and I read a Pickwick Papers out loud to one another when I was about 11. And I think that was, uh, you know, very, um, you know, outdated by the time of my childhood. But my parents both absolutely worshipped at the altar of Dickens and they couldn't wait to introduce him to me. I, I wanted to bring up the issue about this whole, I mean, thinking about why Dickens' world would be less viable than Harry Potter world. It's interesting. I think people are reading less generally, probably reading 19th century fiction less than they used to. But I'm struck by the fact that, I mean, I, I think about this a lot in reading particularly political commentary, but not necessarily just political commentary. The adjective Dickensian comes up so much. It's like somehow or other, whether people have read the book or not, or the books, if you say a Dickensian childhood, that is in general usage, or only Dickens could explain, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so it's interesting how, well, I think in a way you could say this too 
people haven't necessarily read all of Shakespeare, but a Shakespearean tragedy, that means something to them. But Dickens, I think, has a, I can't think of another author where you can invoke his name and immediately there's a world of meaning that is conveyed to people irrespective of whether they have read the books. Mm -hmm. And that might also uh, be a reason why people would want to visit a Dickens site now in a less reading engaged world. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And it is, it is, you know, sort of, I, I, several sort of Dickens scholars have sort of made this point that, um, you know, certainly Oliver Twist and A Christmas Carol, they're kind of part of our culture in a sort of much broader way than any specific book or even any specific film or TV adaptation. And the same with the idea of Dickensian, although if you see Dickensian sort of mentioned early in the 20th century, it, it doesn't necessarily have that dark meaning. You know, you sometimes see it as as a, a, a word for jollity because the Pickwick Papers was like, you know, kind of the big book of Dickens actually in, in the early 20th century. It was seen as often Dickens' greatest work. So Dickensian has not always meant um, the sort of dark, you know, the dark slums and whatever consistently, but I think it certainly has from the mid 20th century onwards and certainly you know, that sort of period. So yeah, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? How, you know, Dickens has this immense reach that is, is beyond, you know, his books or anything. It just, it just it just permeates, to me, it permeates so much of my life. And yet, you know, I came to Dickens, I guess, from watching, when I was a child, from watching BBC adaptations on television. It wasn't initially from reading. I think I picked up a bit of, of interest in Dickens because my my dad, who was born in 1943, he he was a big reader. He was a kind of working class kid, but he used to go to the library and get books out and so on. He he had a great love for Dickens and perhaps that sort of filtered through a bit. But I'm pretty sure I came to Dickens through television um, and the books came later, actually, uh, for me. So, you know, it, it varies. And I think, yeah, it's just this vast sort of cultural reach that's out there, isn't it? And it is, it is quite astonishing. You know, there are very few, everyone has some idea what Dickens means. Let me have some idea what Dickens London means, um, for sure, yeah, absolutely. Renee. Um, not to keep harping on the Harry Potter Dickens connection, um, but one of the things that that is is so interesting to me about, not just, I've not, I haven't been to the Harry Potter world in, um, you said it was in Watford. Mm. But I've been to a few of them that have been recreated in the States at various theme parks and amusement parks. And what, what has been most striking to me about those spaces is that they absolutely look like Dickens land. Like they are, you know, they are so, you know, they're like, those are, those are Victorian streets and Victorian pubs and, you know, Victorian shops that are being recreated and, you know, and given Harry Potter labels. And so I, I think I'm, I'm, interested in just the the ways in which you know as maybe a, a more more explicit you know a, a you know as Dickens lands at Dickens land itself you know lost lost money and and faded faded into history that this kind of weird new version of Dickens land has risen in its place in the form of Harry Potter tourism and you know that that tourism is so much about you know about immersion and about the the you know the the this intense desire to collapse the boundaries between fiction and reality and to you know inhabit these other worlds i mean it, it feels so much to me like like dickens land tourism and then the fact that it it just also looks like dickens land tourism except with just some magic wands and a few more owls instead <laughs> of ravens floating about like like i think that i'm i'm interested in 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 and wondering if maybe you can you can speak a little bit to the to the ways in which a certain kind of um of Dickens tourism has has been repurposed into these other you know into these other forms uh -huh. of tourism or just the 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 ways in which the you know sort of like what Glenn is saying that you know the whatever images Dickensian conjures in our imagination um that those images are so kind of culturally prolific and so profound that um that that in some ways they 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 sort of in, invite a kind of immer immersive tourism, even if it's immersive tourism into a different kind of fictional world. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think one thing to bear in mind when thinking about this generally also, of course, is that Dickens himself um, has a very sort of intuitive connection and plays upon historic sites when he's writing, right? So um, in the Pickwick Papers, when he gets to 
the, the White Hart in the borough, and he, he, there's, an, there's an opening section where he describes the coaching inns with the rambling staircases and, and you know, the, the ancient fabric of these inns. Dickens himself plays with our interest, I think, in sort of, sort of archetypal, quaint, historic place, which already existed before he wrote about it. And he he talks about the, um, he, he jokes in that sort of opening passage describing the coaching inns in the borough about the uh, voracious legends, ver ver not voracious, voracious truth truthful legends which attach um, to these old crumbling uh, crooked places. And of course he's thinking of his own writing at the same time, right? He's thinking that I, I'm using that and I'm I'm adding a legend to, to the Georgian in the borough. You know, I, I'm taking these building blocks and I'm playing with them as well. So I think he's, you know, Dickens actually writes about old places a lot in in his books. He picks out the older parts of London to play with. And that sort of atmospheric, sort of Dickensian quaint London, it was already there. And Dickens sort of sculpts what's there and sort of this general historical interest of the Victorians. I mean, it's interesting, there's, there's a famous passage in get there in the end, um, or Curiosity Shop, where um, he, he writes a letter to Forster, his friend and biographer, that he's been out um, looking for a house for Samson Brass in Bevis Marks in the city of London. So Samson Brass is the lawyer character in the book, is his penal character. And Dickens makes clear he's been scouting this area in London to find a house he can base on. Now, Bevis Marks is often mentioned as sort of his, his sort of engagement with London, but Bevis Marks was one of the most ancient bits of the city that hadn't yet been rebuilt. It was full of sort of full, obviously it had quite a lot of ancient sort of Elizabethan sort of tottering properties of it from two centuries earlier. So Dickens is looking at a sort of a particular type of historicity himself and then using that to spark his own imagination. And that gets filtered through Dickens back to us. And then we, you know, we go that on. And of course, the other thing is that I, I do think I'm afraid, I think a lot of what we see is Dickens London, if we picture it, is through the medium of film and and television and particularly if you look at sort of David Lean's films from the 1940s but other other films going back to the silent era which we don't have now of course but you know at the time I think that those all those all play upon that idea Dickens was playing of a sort of historic magical labyrinthine city but I don't think it's unique to Dickens I think Dickens concentrates it with his sort of power of his imagination and you know it's not actually totally Dickens and Dickens is playing with the sort of contemporary interest in history and old places which is very Victorian um so you know that 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 picture I showed of um, if I can oh, I can't I'm not gonna share a screen again but that picture I showed of the the old London the old London street of 1884 that was you know very much about this can we, can we build this sort of virtual 3d environment to live in? and it wasn't it wasn't based on Dickens work but it's sort of in, interrelated to it so yeah I think I think there's a lot going on there about history and how we think about history I think Dickens also talks about that in his books. I, I won't. I won't go about it here because I probably can't think of all the examples. Um, anyone, anyone interested in that? I, I wrote an article in Dickens Quarterly a few minutes back about it. Um, but Dickens is fascinated by history and historic place. He uses it, uh, and I think plays with it, sort of people's own expectations. Okay, the, one thing I thought. So th there's a great in Edwin Drood. He talks, and he knows this, and he, he often being so he's such a self-referential writer, right? He, he often refers to his own sort of his own the way he uses things himself. So in Edwin Drood, there's the nun's house in Rochester, which is this ancient place supposed to belong to nuns, and he conjures up this. He describes him you know, that you can imagine the nuns walking around, and you can imagine them bending their heads. Although, yeah, I you know, he's sort of in prayer, but actually, you know, I, I think they probably bent their heads because the beams were so low in this place, you know. And so he's, he's mocking this sort of quaint idea. Of the nuns and this this historic image, this sort of gothic image, and he said, "Well, actually, perhaps it's to do with the beams." And so it's, it's sort of mocking the ideas we project onto history, and he does it all the time himself. He plays with it. So yeah, I could go on about history. I mean, incoherently as I'm doing at the moment, I could go on <laughs> about history for ages. But Dickens, yeah, he thinks a lot about this in his work himself, and yeah, I, it's, it's quite complex. I'm, I'm not sure. I have a, I, obviously, I don't have a good answer to it. I'm rambling. <laughs> No, that was a good ramble, uh, yeah. an appropriate term for, for Dickens. So, Carrie. Uh, yeah, un unlike Lee, we didn't have um, Dickens TV shows, but I came to Dickens and other literature through classics, illustrated comic books. Um, mm, interesting. And, you know, read them before I was in high school and then read a lot of them in high school and then obviously in college. Um, and I just want to mention some of those comic books you can find at a site called archive.org. 
Okay, yeah, I know it, yeah. Yeah, and it's free. You establish an account. They ask for a contribution eventually if you keep using it, but there's a lot of material there, including comic books. Yeah, I'll have a look. That's really interesting, actually, yeah. Very good. Thanks for that uh, suggestion. Shana. Yeah, I was, I was saying originally that uh, I inherited from my mother-in-law um, all the stories of Dickens written in the late 1800s by Christopher and company. Um, and the books themselves are uh, all brown, you know, because they're so old. And, but the, the, um, the pictures and the, uh, the things of the drawings are still totally intact. And so it's, it brought me back to thinking, well, gee, I, I guess I should read some Dickens again, you know? So I'm kind of glad that I, I found the books because now I'll read, uh, I'm going to read them online though, but uh, Tale of Two Cities and uh, jump into um, since the festivals in, at UCSC and I'm in Santa Cruz. Is it a Zoom festival or is there live talks too? There, there is a virtual registration for okay. the conference as well as uh, an in-person registration. Okay, so great. A lot more fun to come in person since you- I live. want to come in person since I live here. So uh, uh, I'm very thankful that the, I saw this today on the events of Santa Cruz and uh, thank you very much. Okay. I'll become a member now. <laughs> glad, you, glad you found us. Thank you, thank you. Um, any, any other questions that I- uh, can pass on to Lee. I, I had a, a, a another question, Lee. Um, you, you focused for very clear reasons on those two sites, the uh, Oliver, the Nancy Steps from Oliver and uh, uh, the old Curiosity Shop. And I, I was, and, and your interest has, has been primarily on London. Um, mm. But what is the uh, extent of Dickens tourism outside uh, of London and what books, I mean, I, I'm trying to think about the, the, the books that have the most enduring emotional appeal for a general audience and Pickwick is certainly among them. Um, and, and Pickwick has London scenes, but it has much that is not in, in sure. London. Um, sure. I mean, and Little Little Dart has a an, a major London site associated with it. But what other what other books seem to be important for the the Dickens yeah well I mean her I, I, heritage yeah, industry sure I mean the the obvious mission for my book I, I just didn't have time to think about it it's kind of different very different for London is is Dickens Kent has been you know also called Dickens Land um, and you know from from the start people obviously associate this where Dickens was living when he died. He'd been there, he had fond associations with Kent. He grew up um, in Kent for quite a few years in his childhood. Um, you see um, Kent in, as you say, the Pickwick Papers, so the village of Cobham, um, you know, it's still there. You can still go to the um, the pub in the Cobham, which is described in, in, in the Pickwick Papers. That's quite impressive. Um, although interestingly, so the, the pub in Cobham, which I'm, I'm struggling to remember the name of the oh, leather bottle, the leather bottle in Cobham, right? Which is a typically quaint English pub. It's very much in the Pickwick Papers. Dickens visited it himself. Um, and you go and see it now and you think, well, that, that's just so typically sort of, um, and it has that half timbered look of the sort of exposed beams and, and so on on the outside of the building. Um, but that look was only produced at the end of the 19th century when people wanted things to look more Tudor. Dickens would have known it with none of that woodwork on the, on the pub visible. It was all plastered over in his period. So again, that sort of shows how buildings change a bit over time and how we try and sort of conform to what we think looks historical. It's been made to look more historical since Dickens died. Um, but yeah, Cobbin and Kent is a great one. The, 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 um, the churchyard in Cooling, which is, of course, the churchyard which features at the start of Great Expectations with the scene with Magwitch and Pitt. That's also, you know, in the, in the district, not far from there at all. Um, and, you know, Kentish tourism has been going, Rochester itself, of course, um, both in the Pickwick Papers and in Edwin Drood. Rochester Castle. Um, Dickens had hoped to be buried, you know, near Rochester Castle, but of course was he was whisked away to Westminster Abbey slightly against his posthumous wishes. Um, so yeah, there's quite there's quite a few sites in Dickens Kent. And if you look up Dickens Kent, the uh, the local authorities always pushed it as a Dickensian a Dickensian area, and it is. And yeah, there's lots of places you can visit. Rochester is amazing, of course, but equally you've got the actual historic sites. I mean, you've got in Rochester, of course, you've got Dickens's chalet, the writing chalet, which used to be um 
opposite it used to be on the sort of the field opposite his home in Kenny. It was like this IKEA type prefab. It was a Swiss chalet. It was given to him by a friend and he used it to write his books in. It was demolished. After he died, it then went to a stately home somewhere in Kent, and now it's in um, the grounds of Eastgate House in Rochester. So you can go and see Dickens's old writing chalet, which is quite an odd thing, a Swiss chalet in the middle of Rochester. So yeah, Rochester certainly, Dickens Kent, and you know Bath has, has some associations because of the Pickwick Papers. Um, there's lots of places that claim, you know, if you look in, if you go to the Dickens Museum, they have a whole sort of set of shelves of, of places with Dickens tourism, and places you look at, what on earth has that got to do with Dickens? But the he went everywhere, as we know. He lectured everywhere. He visited everywhere. He supported every single course. There aren't many places that had no connection to Dickens at all. Um, so just come to England, you know, you'll find somewhere pretty swiftly. Thank you. Glenna? I was just going to say, apropos of literary tourism, uh, I'm sure some of you also have seen that um, they've just uncovered in, in Rome the site where uh, apparently Julius Caesar was assassinated. And I wonder, uh, you know, I, I would imagine that's going to be quite a red hot tourist spot. Um, and then the other thing, I, again, I've talked about this with people in the Dickens group before. I had a Fulbright to teach American history in Russia about 21 years ago, and I fell in love with Pushkin. And the amount of literary tourism that is possible in Russia, sadly, I'm the Ukraine situation has has made me. Uh, now I've seen that Pushkin was often used as an instrument of Russian imperialism, uh, kind of a grim thought. But you can go to the estate where Pushkin wrote um, Eugene Onegin, and they'll tell you. And this was Eugene's bench, and uh, so you can go to Pushkin's. High school, you can go to, there's a museum where he got married, the church where he got married. I mean, it's just stunning. There must be oh, at least 20 major Pushkin sites, some featuring uh, fictional representations and some places that he's associated with. But um, I was just stunned by the possibilities for literary tourism in that country. I mean, that sounds like what, Dickens London was like at the start of the 20th century there were so many places you can go to and you know there are now but they're more hints and suggestions of what London perhaps once looked like but um and you know to some degree people found it a bit overwhelming you do, you do hear criticism that you know why are these why are these Dickensians constantly looking for you know the, the water pump at which Dickens stood for two minutes on you know or, or the, the 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 marker on the Dover Road whatever you know and so there is some mockery of it as well but yeah the, I, th I think, you know, Dickens also at the start of the 20th century in particular, more, much more so now, was this great national hero um, ring, which, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think he's quite a hero now, he's a great literary figure and so on, but I think it blends in with, sort of, again, you talk about empire, I think the British Empire as well, he becomes, he becomes adopted as this icon in, in various ways. Um, so, yeah, that's, no, that's fascinating. I mean, I, I'm not actually, dare I say, I'm not a massive fan of literary tourism, but I just find in terms of visiting places but i find it really interesting why we want to and what what connections we're trying to make and equally you know i'll, sort of, I'll probably finish soon but on the so I, i've done various bits of work at the dickens museum and um i, I suppose i overthink this stuff but i was i was there one time and i was walking down the stairs at the museum and i thought yeah this is this is this is remarkable this is the banister that dickens himself would have and then i remembered that i was in number 49 which is the house that bought next to the Dickens Museum, which the house Dickens had nothing to do with. But so it, it's funny how you project your own sort of fantasies as well into these places. And yet they're, you know, it's very real as well, because you can there is something about touching or being in physical contact. Um, you do feel that connection, I think. And okay, you can fantasize it about it as well. That's that's the other thing. So it's it's yeah, it's very complicated. I don't I don't claim in time to understand it by any means. Yes, Renee. Um, I was just wondering if there are any Dickens novels that kind of don't make their way into the world of Dickens tourism. Like, I mean, I know a lot of it is sort of, you know, sort of Dickens himself or the, you know, the world of the world of Dickens, which is not necessarily novel specific. But of course, there are some novels, as you pointed out, that are that are absolutely specifically, you know, 
like part of the part of the world of tourism. And I'm, I'm wondering if there are any that just sort of aren't. Um, not really. I mean, I, mean, I mean, certainly not, you know, perhaps not, you know, now you perhaps say, well, you know, people just mainly think about Oliver Twist or, you know, Christmas Carol or what have you. But historically, no, I mean, not really, the, the only obvious exception maybe hard times in that, you know, it's not London based and it's not, um, you know, it, there, there aren't so many particular locations in it. I don't, I don't know much of the tourism to do with that, that book, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting actually, you know, it's sort of bound to be the character in that book, um, who is this sort of braggart who, who's been brought up by his bootstraps and, you know, he he taught, that's the one place he taught, we hear about London in that book and it's that he used to live in, he was found, you know, in a, in a in, an, in I don't know a crate in 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 Seven Dials, and he he was lived lived in the middle of the slums, and were, and ev eventually you learn that this was all sort of um, made up nonsense. He was just pretending he had this um, this upbringing in the slums to, to just you know for weird sort of retrospective boasting about how far he'd come in life. And I think a lot, but I think also in when Dickens does that, he's also thinking himself about his own writing about London and his own sort of fantasy of London he's created in books like Oliver Twist. Um, but yeah, I think Hard Times is probably the, the only one, um, the only one I can think of that doesn't have much tourism associated with it. Well, are, are there other questions? Any other hands want to be raised? Anything in the chat, Renee, that you see that we need to pass along to Lee? No, the, um, but uh, Robert Hoffman did put a YouTube link in the chat to um, to something that might be one of the silent films that Lee was talking about. So, um, so if anyone wants to wants to click on that link before the meeting ends, so you have it handy, um, I'll just draw your attention to it. Okay, thank you. Well, I think we can bring our meeting to a close, and and I hope you will join me in thanking Lee for this very interesting presentation. Um, we look forward to the publication of Dickens Land. And uh -huh. uh, just to remind you, that will be coming out from Yale University Press in September. I think I have that right. Correct. So, yeah, so yeah. Lee, thank you for awesome. helping us to explore further the, the land of, of Dickens. And uh, uh, we look forward to reading the book. and. All of you, I recommend strongly that you you look at the website on Victorian London that uh, Lee has curated for uh, many years. So thank you again, Lee. Thank you much. It's much appreciated. Cheers. Bye. Bye. <laughs>